Recordings in progress. Okay, so for those of you that don't know who Brian Tracy is, we've talked about him a few different times. We've gone over a few of his different classes and things like that in these trainings. He's been around for a long, long time as a sales coach, trainer, motivational speaker, business coach, things along those lines. Very well respected within the within that type of community. So I stumbled upon something that he did called cold calling tips to keep prospects on the phone and increase skills. Now, naturally, being in real estate, being part of a company like ours, being part of a system like Mike Ferry, anytime I see something that says cold calling tips, my ears perk up because do we all want more tips on cold calling? Right? Are we all looking for how do I make cold calling better? Because let's be honest, is cold calling fun? No, not really. Not really. You know, <laughs> Maria says, yeah, it's very exciting. It's exciting if you have if you have an alignment with your goals for sure. But I always say this, you know, if you had a choice, you woke up and money was not the option. And you could go to the beach today, or you could get up and make 30 just less to just sold calls. Which would you do? You would probably go to the beach, right? So, we're, but we're always looking for tips. We're always looking for how do we make cold calling better? How do we make it more exciting? What's the magic pill? What's the secret? So I, I was going through this with him, not with him, like I was personally with him with his, um, with his suggestions. And I found that there's a lot of really good things in there that are really relatable to our business. Cause you have to understand he works with all kinds of businesses. So like some of the things he was talking about cold calling were, weren't too relevant for real estate. So I kind of got those out of the way, but there was a lot of stuff that I think could be very powerful for us as we're making our calls to try to find more and more business. So I want to go through some of the things that he said. And then I also wrote down some notes on how we implement that specific to real estate. So let's go ahead and jump into that. But before we do that, he started out by asking the question, what is the success rate of cold calling? Okay. And he said this, that despite its difficulty, it is one of the most effective techniques for gaining leads and making eventual sales. And he said, as many as 82% of buyers say they are willing to meet with a salesperson who contacts them with a cold call. 82% of buyers say they're willing to meet with a salesperson who contacts them with a cold call. In fact, 62% of buyers are hoping to hear from product or service representatives when they are actively looking for a solution to a problem. Okay, 62% of buyers are hoping to hear from a product or service representative when they're actively looking for a solution to a problem. Many cold calls lead to a meeting with a potential client of people contacted with a cold call. 75% ended up scheduling a meeting or attending an event because of the unsolicited call. So the point is, as he's before he gets into these tips on making cold call more successful, he wanted to just let us know, hey, look, this really does work. This really does work. Because be honest, have you ever thought to yourself, I don't know if cold calling works anymore. You ever had a day like that? I don't know if this is going to work anymore. It's me, Iris, and 31. Yes. Lovers. Okay, got it. Thank you, Sam. So we have to remind ourselves that it works. Okay, so let's jump into this cold calling tips to increase your success rate. So he didn't say if these were written down in any particular order. So I'm just going to go through as he put them down. So the first thing he wrote down here is know your prospect well before you pick up the phone. Know your prospect well before you pick up the phone. Research, researching your prospect is the most important thing you can do before making a cold call. Knowing some information about them will give you insight into questions to ask and topics to talk about. Ultimately, your goal is to understand how you can meet their needs with your product or service. So 
What would be an example in real estate terms of know your prospect well before you pick up the phone? Market stats. Market stats, right. So before I pick up the phone and call someone in Kavina, I should probably know the market stats in Kavina because that's what they want to know. I need to know my prospect. That's Armin's specialty. There it is. Yeah. Every morning, every morning, I know everything that's going on in Covina and West Covina and Fountain Valley because Josie does the same thing. So know the market. What's another way? Okay. Market stats. Absolutely. How else would you know your prospect? What's another example of know your prospect before you pick up the phone? Knowing some information about them that will give you some insight. Think name? predictive analytics. What will be another thing that you could know? So how about this? If I got a list and I knew everybody I was calling was in a home that was 2,500 or more square feet and bought 20 or more years ago. If I know that's who I'm calling, could I customize my pitch to provide a solution specifically for them? Yes or no? Either give me a yes. thumbs up, put a one in the chat box. Yes. Unmute Absolutely. yourself. Let me know you're yep. here. Yes. Okay. All right. There's 32 of you. I was going to say you need to do the list the night before or get it yeah. done. Otherwise, you're going to sit all morning and by the time noontime, you're barely calling. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Do it the night before, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so if, I, if I had a list of those kind of people, I would know my product. So I could call them and say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, we're working with a lot of people just like yourself that have been in their homes for 25 or more years. And they're looking to downsize because they don't need the size of this lot anymore. Have you considered that? Now I'm speaking directly to them instead of just a, hey, market's hot. Have you thought about selling? What could be another example of that? We talk about it all the time. Condos. Yeah, condos. What if I had a list of condos that were two bedrooms or smaller? And I, and I knew my customer. And gosh, I know that two bedroom or smaller condos have a higher turnover rate. And, you know, it gets pretty tight in there. So I could customize my pitch to that instead of, again, just call and say, hey, market's hot. Hey, do you know anyone's looking to buy or sell real estate? I know my prospect before I pick up the phone because I've done the market research. I know if, if it's a specific list as far as the type of list that I'm calling. I've previewed property in the area. You know, I know something that's going on because remember, the goal is to understand how you can meet their needs with your product or service. Well, if they're in a condo, two bedrooms or smaller, I have a product or service. I can help them sell this and move into something bigger, either a larger condo, townhouse, or a single family residence. Or, hey, look, you've been in this house for 25 or more years. It's over 2,500 square feet. Chances are you're in your 60s, 70s, you know, for anyone that's that, that large of house. Most people don't buy a house that size when they're in their 30s or something along those lines. So you might not need this house anymore. I can sell it and get you into something more comfortable. Know your prospect well before you pick up the phone. Never call anybody with just a, hey, calling people just to see if you know anyone who's looking to buy or sell. Hey, want to let you know the market's hot. Don't do that. Have something. Wrote down here, proper research will allow you to personalize and offer value to your cold call and the prospect will appreciate that you are in tune with their needs instead of making a generic call with a stale cold calling script. Here's the other thing. What? Write this down. Everybody wants what everyone else has. Everybody wants what everyone else has. And I also want you to write down underneath that, Nobody wants to be first and nobody wants to be last. So here's what I mean. If I call someone, again, who's in a two-story home or a 2,500 square foot home that was bought 25 more years ago, and I call them and I say, we're working with a lot of people just like yourself. 
that are in larger homes that are looking to downsize. By saying it that way, what they think is, well, wait a second, there's people like me that are doing this. Which means I'm not first. I'm not the guinea pig. I don't want to do that. But I also don't want to be last. I don't want to be the one that misses out. So hold on. Maybe I should listen to this. That's the so, other that's the other advantage of personalizing the script. Yes. Oh, so we're basically trying to go down and find a more specific, very tight list, right? Yeah. Very specific. Yeah. It's kind of like if you were to yes. reach out and recruit, for example, you would like do your re research on who that person is or what their production, da da da. Correct. And Correct. you tailor it to them. Correct. But yes. the thing I see is that when you do that, though, and say if you either call like a special niche, like for sale by owner expire or just, you know, the condos. I mean, you make it so narrow that there if, if there has to be enough people to call too, right? Right. So you you don't so have be to make everything a niche. You could just okay. but even if you're just calling around the area call with market stats that affect the people in that area. So my question is this. So if I were to call, say, two bedroom, two bath condos or just condos in general, right? You know, and I know that there's stats in here. Would it be more efficient if you just take that whole community, whatever numbers in there and just call there and no matter if it's two bedroom, one bedroom or four, three bedrooms? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. 100%. 100%. All right, good. So moving down the list, moving down the list. The next thing here, wrote down here, be very patient and persistent. Be very patient and persistent. To succeed at call, cold calling, you have to have patience. Now, who here besides me has moments in life when they are not very patient? <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what makes cold calling very difficult at times. You need patience. So according to a study done, now this wasn't just for real estate. The real estate number is going to be a lot higher. But according to studies done that of companies that make cold calls, it takes an average of 18 calls to make a connection with a possible buyer. Now they use buyer as like a client, you know, so it could just be, it doesn't have to be like an actual someone buying or selling a house. So at least, at least an average of 18 calls to make a connection with a buyer. You may be sent to voicemail countless times, asked to leave a message, so on and so forth. And if you give up too soon, you may miss a golden opportunity. So the point is, is that even in other industries that make cold calls, they go through, they have to go through a lot of voicemails, a lot of disconnected numbers. It takes 18 calls on average to connect with somebody. So you just have to be patient. You have to go through it. Now, here's the other thing. 92% of people in sales give up on a prospect after four no's. However, 80% of prospects say no four times before they say yes. Another question, Robert. Yes. Do you recommend leaving voicemail on the first cold call or it depends on what? Me individually, now this is something that everyone will have their own opinion on. I like leaving voicemails because I want them to know that I called. So okay. if I call them again, then they might recognize that I've called them before. And by leaving a voicemail, I at least give myself a chance that they might return my call. Not very likely, but at least I'm giving myself a chance. And so it only takes, you know, 30 seconds to a minute to leave a quick voicemail. But... There are a lot of people that would disagree with that and say, no, just move on. And well, I don't you, think there's a right or wrong answer. That's just my personal feeling. Okay. I, I, I'm My personal mentality is I always want to be in the game. And calling someone and not leaving a voicemail means that call, I wasn't in the game. That, that's my mentality. It doesn't make it right or wrong, but that's my mentality. If I leave a voicemail, all right, I at least put myself in the game, put myself out there. So everyone's got their own opinion on that. That one's mine. Robert, I just want to, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. You said 92% give up after four calls. 92% of people in sales give up on a prospect after four no's. 
of the four says minutes. no four times a client at the sales people give up they say okay they're not interested however 80 percent of prospects say no four times before they say yes wow. so so here would be an example i call someone and i say Hey, great. You know, so I'm curious, who do you know that we might want to move into the area? Well, I don't know anyone. Okay. Well, there's one no. Okay. So I didn't get the referral. Well, when do you plan on moving? We haven't really thought about it. There's two. And I go through the script, right? You know, if you were to move, where would you go? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm just trying to find leads, you know, or I might oh, find okay. someone and I call them <laughs> and they it. say, yeah, we thought about it. Okay, okay great. Well, you know, uh, why don't we get together tomorrow at four o'clock? Well, no, we're, we're not quite ready for that. Okay, there's the first no. Okay, and then I just keep asking, well, I have to talk to my wife. I have to do this. Like they, they push you off four, five, at least up to four times. And it's usually the fifth one, they don't push you off. You go, through a, I, you go through a listing presentation. I, right thought, I thought it was four times, four times you try and then you drop them, but it's actually four times you try in that one conversation. I in that it. one conversation or that yeah. one lead, you know, so you might get a lead and then you call them again and they're still, they still say, no, we're not ready for an appointment. And then you call them again. No, we're still not ready for an appointment. And after, after four times they say we're not ready, most salespeople give up, but usually on that fifth one is when they'll actually say, yeah, you know what? We're ready now. That's okay. That's really good. Okay. Yeah. Pretty interesting stuff. So you have to be patient. You have to be persistent. This is part of the gig. Now, here's the important thought to write down or to at least understand. People will not automatically trust someone who is calling them out of the blue. We kind of do the same thing, right? Someone just calls us out of the blue, says, hey, you know, we want to come over and talk about your solar panels. Most of us don't go, well, come on over. Here right now, you we ask questions, or we might go, oh, Hold on a second, now let me uh, who a company you work for, who are you, you know, things along those lines. We typically don't just get them here, so we kind of push off a little bit. We have this wall that we hang up, and so that's everyone else. We have to earn their trust, which takes some time, consistency, things along those lines. This is also why I would all, always suggest to people when you make a call, if they're not interested in buying or selling, they don't know anyone, try to get them into your database. Great, Mr. and Mrs. Client. Well, one of the things that I do for other people in your area, because again, people don't want to miss out. One of the other things they do for people in your area is I keep them updated on the market every couple months, even if they're not interested in buying or selling. Would you mind if I did the same thing for you? Well, yeah, sure. So now I have somebody, my first initial call, I'm this far apart. I'm here, they're here, There's, we're, we're far apart. But I add them to my database. And two months later, I give them a call for an update. And now we're a little bit closer because now they've got a, another call for me. And then two months after that, I make another call. So now they've had three calls for me. And each call I make gets me a little bit closer to where maybe after four or five calls, I now have a relationship to where they know who I am. They know why I'm calling. They know I'm in real estate. And now I have a chance to get some referrals from them, or maybe they might actually ask me some real estate stuff. So it takes time. Can I ask one more quick question? Yes. Okay. So just say if you had a good conversation, somebody called, you call them the first time on there. What do you have as far as recommending like a process, like, you know, the honeymoon phase, like, you know, three to five days, you do like a you know, one touch a week or, you know, eight by eight or something like that. What, what, what do you suggest or what are your thoughts? Is on it, it? It's somebody that is just added that's like, not interested in buying or selling and I'm <clears> adding <throat> to my database. Yeah. Like, you know, is a good, like, like, I feel like, you know, you, you reach somebody for the first time, they might not interested, but you know, you have a good conversation. You think they might be a good potential. You want to test it out, you know, but instead of putting them, call them back in three months later or something. And then you get their email address and you add them to the, the weekly email. And I'm thinking, is there like a, that little quick honeymoon process? I would process? call them in a month. I would call them in a month and just to check in and give them a market update. And just and keep then it simple. And, like and then after that, I would do it every two months. Okay. If I wait two months, they'll forget me. So if I give them a call, but if I give them a call in a month, they'll remember because a month remember. flies by pretty quickly. Okay. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. That's um, that's one of the things that I 
that I had to change rubber. That's what that's what happened with me. I was so impatient and I was just moving on, moving on, moving on, moving on until they just until my coach just cornered me and say, you are the same. You just like them. You're no different than them. You do the same when people call you. What do you do? Exactly. They're doing the same thing to you. So. So, yes, he says, yeah. you got to change the strategy. You got to put yourself in their thing. shoes. They don't trust you. They don't know you. They don't. Put right. yourself in their shoes. All yeah. Right. Thank you, sir. Yeah, 100%. You're 100% right. They don't know you. They don't have no idea who you are. Plus, let's be honest, okay? In the public eye, are real estate agents viewed in a positive light? No. No, we're not. That's the truth. No. Okay. So, so I'm a real estate agent calling somebody out of the blue. They, they, they think I'm some sleazy salesperson, doesn't know what they're doing, overpaid, and I'm trying to sell them on buying and selling their house. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. All right. Next one I wrote down here. Don't over attempt. Don't over attempt to sell them on the first cold call. Don't over attempt. So here's what I mean by over attempt. You call them, they say they're interested, but they want you to follow up with them and you keep trying to push, 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 push. Well, no, let's get this goal. Let's, let's sign this. Let's do this. Blah, 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 blah. You're over attempting on the first cold call. You've lost their trust. They don't want to talk to you anymore. You call you try to close for an appointment. If they're not ready for the appointment, you get the lead, you follow up. This is your chance to build trust. Close for the appointment, always try to set an appointment, but don't over attempt on the first cold call, okay? Because again, remember, they are building trust with you. Just get the information, get the lead. Neil says this all the time. Prospecting is lead generating, lead follow-up is appointment setting. Get the lead. Get the lead. Try to set the appointment. If they're not going for it and they want you to follow up or they have to talk to somebody else before they set the appointment, that's fine. Follow up. Don't over attempt to sell on the first cold call. All right. Next point here. Use rejection to your advantage. Use rejection to your advantage. In sales, you must be willing to accept rejection. Okay, that's just part of the gig. Now expect rejection and don't take it pers- and don't take it personally. If a client says they're not interested in buying or selling real estate, is that a personal vendetta against you? No. They don't even know you. So it's not a personal thing. Don't take it personally. All right? Instead, analyze why the prospect may have said no and use this to improve your pitch. I'm going to say this again. Analyze why the prospect may have said no and use this to improve your pitch, product, research, or, and approach. So let me give you, let me tell you why this is so important. Well, everybody keeps telling me no. Everybody keeps telling me no, but I see listings in my area. Okay, well, here's, here's, a little, here's a little game you can play. Because if, if, if everyone is telling you no, but there are listings in your area, then one of two things is happening. Either A, you're not talking to enough people, or B, you need to improve your pitch. So here's what you can do. Go to your area, your little market area that you do, that you call on, that you prospect, and look at all the listings in the area and, and see did you ever talk to the owner of that property? So you work wherever, right? You pick Arcadia, for example, go back, look at all the listings in Arcadia. You can do current and start with current listings because, you know, just to give yourself some, an idea and okay. One, two, three main street in Arcadia. Did I ever talk to the owner of that property? If you find that, you had never spoke to the owner of these properties. You had never door knocked that property. You never called that area. Then you simply need your rejection is simply that you're not talking to enough people because you didn't talk to the people that were listing. 
Now, if you go through that list and you say, yeah, I, I did door knock this area. They never gave me a lead. They never told me they were selling. I did call this area. I never got any leads. Then it's your pitch and you need to improve your pitch because clearly they were interested in selling. But when you prospected them, they didn't like what you had to say or they didn't like how you said it. So therefore you need to improve your pitch. But this is why this is important. Okay, you can use rejection to your advantage. There's a sales cliche. You've heard me say this a hundred times for those of you that have been around me that I think is stupid and I don't care what anybody says. And that sales cliche is every no gets me closer to a yes. And that's dumb because if you don't improve your pitch, every no gets you closer to another no. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, this is uh, Robert with, you know, uh, Century 21. I mean, do you want to possibly sell your home? Nope. Okay, well, let me do that again. Every no gets me closer to a yes. <laughs> hey, Mr. Uh, seller, do you maybe possibly, oh, no, this is Robert. With... No. Analyze your re rejection and figure out how do I improve my pitch? Am I doing the script correctly? And do I have enough energy? Am I saying um too much? Am I doing upswings when I should be doing downswings? Am I doing downswings when I should be doing upswings? Don't take it personal rejection. Expect it. And then when you're getting a lot of it, analyze it, figure out how do I get better? Is it my pitch? Is it I'm not giving enough market research? Okay. Did I not have enough information before I made the call? That happened to me one time. I had this really great idea that I was going to make a commercial call. I had one problem calling a commercial prospect. I had one problem. Okay. The problem was I didn't know anything about commercial real estate. So I called the person and they're like, yeah, I'm interested. Can you tell me X, 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 and X? And I just went, uh, and the client literally said, you know what? I appreciate the call, but why don't you just transfer me to someone who knows what they're doing? I said, that's a good idea. So <laughs> that, that did not get me a sale, but the rejection made me realize, Hey, you know what? You can't just call people. So analyze the rejection, figure out what you need to get better at. And if you, not, if you're not sure, I would always, always recommend you to record your prospecting and send it to your coach, send it to me, send it to Neil. We, we listen to it and we'll give you some feedback on it. Okay. But use it to your advantage. Right. Now, here's the other thing about rejection. There's a difference between rejection and objection. There's a difference between rejection and objection. So here's what I mean. A rejection is, I'm not interested in selling. Thanks for calling. Click. That's a rejection. Nothing you can do. An objection is someone says, well, I would be interested in selling, but I don't know where I would go. And we don't do anything with it. There's a deal possibly there somewhere we didn't dig. We didn't ask another question. That's not rejection. That's objection. So for some of you, you might be thinking, God, I keep getting rejected. Well, let's go through some of these people. What did they say? Well, they said this. Well, that was an objection. That wasn't rejection. That was objection. They don't know if they can afford it. That's an objection. Figure it out. Get, to, get them to a lender. Dig deeper. Well, they want to sell, but they're thinking not for, not for like six or seven months. That's not rejection. That's objection, possibly. Could be rejection because maybe they really do have a reason. So make sure you're analyzing all that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this next one because you already know it. He says, outline what you want to say in advance, which is another way of saying what? Script? Script. Yeah, scripts. That's it. So he says, read scripts. We talk about that all the time, so I don't need to spend much time on that. <laughs> so I don't need to spend much time on that. You get that one. But he did say, this is something really important. If you want to get really good at cold calling, 
Don't just read the script. Don't just read the script. Practice it. This is what he says. Practice it so it becomes your personalized script. Don't just read it. So here's what he's talking about is, all right, I'm going to make a just listed call. I have my just listed script in front of me. Now you should have your script in front of you. But if you've never read it before, don't do this. Hey, this is Robert with Century 21 Masters. We just <clears throat> listed a home for sale over on Primrose Lane. I mean, um, Main Street. Uh, and it's three bedrooms, two bathrooms. You're just reading the script. Can Practice it so you personalize it to where it sounds like you. Hey, this is Robert with Century 21 Masters. We just listed the property over on 123 Main Street. It's three bedrooms, two bathrooms, blah, blah, blah. So can I ask a question about scripts and Yes. Okay. So let's just say if you in the just list, it just sold script versus a hot market script, right? Basically yeah. the opening is a little bit different, right? Yes. So what, I guess what you said about like, you know, you're calling, you know, circle calling, or you're calling somebody and you ask asking if they want to buy or sell, you know, independent answer and you say, move on to the next or whatever, or versus going, keep going down longer, you know, and uh, just as just, this is just so script. So what is the thoughts of that? I mean, what's, I, I know you're trying to, you know, get away from a smoke screen, right? We're talking about sales. Yeah. So, so that's, I guess that's when the third or fourth question come in to see if there's smoke screens or not, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, who do you know that would like to move into the area? I don't know anyone. Okay, great. Let me go. When do you plan on moving? I'm not moving. All right. Well, let me just keep going. You know, until they, here's, here's what's, here's an important thought. Is an important thought that everyone needs to understand this. When you're making cold calls, the client should hang up before you do. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if you just keep asking questions, you might find something in there because yes, a lot of it could be a smoke screen. It could just be that reflex. No, as we talk about, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. We, again, we do the same thing. So if I keep asking questions, then I might find something. Well, where would you go if you, if ideally in a perfect world, if you were going to move, where would you go? Well, gosh, if I could move, I would obviously go to the beach. Right. So it doesn't really matter if it's just list, just sold. You can call like a hot market or whatever. Anybody. It's just a change line. It's just that two, three question down, right? Yep. Because to me, to me, when you call anything trying to ask me to sell a house and I was like, you're calling, hey, do you want to get your wisdom, uh, wisdom teeth pulled yeah. today? Oh, I get it. I get it. Okay. I get it. Got it. Thank All right. You. Good stuff. A couple more points here as we wrap up. All right. Next one he wrote down here. Zero in on your ideal customer. If you want to make cold calling even better, zero in on your ideal customer. Now, here's what this means. You could take this a couple different ways. This doesn't have to be, well, I'm only looking for a, you could make it, I'm looking for really this person. Okay. Absentee owner, you know, that's had the property for a certain amount. I mean, you could get really specific if you want to, but you don't necessarily have to be super specific. An ideal customer could just be somebody within a certain radius of where you live. So get bigger by getting smaller. So let me give you an example. Sometimes we subscribe to numbers and we say, all right, well, I want all the for sale by owners in LA County. Okay, so I have a list of for sale by owners in LA County. I live in Pasadena. This is a for sale by owner in Long Beach. Okay, well, I'm probably not going to get that for sale by owner. So why do I even have the number? Why am I even prospecting that person? So you could, when I say zero in on your ideal customer, could just be like certain cities. It doesn't have to be, it could be, specific targets, but it doesn't have to be. So I don't want to make it seem, you know, one is right over the other, but figure out who you really want to work with and then prospect those areas, prospect those clients, right? That's really what you can be working on. All right, next line here, track what time you're calling them. Track what time you're calling them. Why is it good to track what time you're calling them? Why is it good to track what time you're calling them? 
You're talking about tracking just your general random calling, or you're talking yeah, yeah. About if I'm if I'm if I want to if I want to call a certain area, if I have a certain list, and I'm calling through this list, why is it a good idea to track what time I called them? I don't think that's good because you really want just a call when you can, especially in the morning. There's, there energy, is there right? is a reason. Why would it be a good idea to track what time I called them? Well, one thing would be if Pick up uh, right. you called, say, early morning that particular list. And it's an area you, and you didn't hardly talk to anyone. You might want to try that list at a different time. Yes, you're both right. Pick up rate, because I can track to see what time for this particular area. I'm getting the best, best pickup time. But also, also right, if I call someone at 10 in the morning and they don't answer, and I call someone and I do that, and I call that person again tomorrow at 10, and they don't answer. And I call that person a third time at 10 the next day and they don't answer. Maybe they're just not available at 10. So maybe I should call them a different time. <clears throat> See, sometimes we get in this habit of I'm trying to follow up with a lead. I'm trying to call. I want to really work this particular area. And I call from nine to 12 and I get the same people to pick up from nine to 12 and these other people I never get to call. Well, maybe they're not available from nine to 12. So do an afternoon prospecting session one day a week and try to see if it works that time. <clears throat> so track what time you're calling them so you know what's working and what's not working. Also, if you have someone that does answer and they say, yeah, I'm interested, you know, but follow up with me next week. And I called them and it was 1130 when I got them on the phone. And I call them next week and it's 9 a.m. because it's my first call of the day and they don't answer. And I just keep calling them at 9 a.m. Maybe I can go back and say, well, they answered at 1130. Maybe that's when they take their lunch break. Let me call them at 1130 again. See, almost everybody has the same schedule every day. Most people get up at the same time every day. They go to work at the same time every day. They take lunch at the same time every day. They're off work at the same time every day. They take breaks at the same time every day. Most people have the same schedule every day. Mm -hmm. So if I get somebody on the phone at a certain time and I can see what time that was, chances are tomorrow, that's what time they're going to be available again. Almost everybody has the same schedule on a daily basis. So track what time you're talking to people. Track what time you're calling people. All right, a couple more points here, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. All right, he wrote down here next. Make it a conversation. You want to make cold calling better, make it a conversation. You make it a conversation by doing a couple things. Asking a lot of questions to get them involved. Two, seem interested in their answers. And three, ask and provide relevant information. Then you make it a conversation. The more, the better a conversation is, the better the outcome is going to be. All right. And then we're getting right up on one o'clock. So I'm going to just kind of speed through the last couple items here. All right. And that is, he wrote down here, ask open-ended questions. Okay, we talk about this a lot. Try to get away from the yes or no questions. Open-ended questions. Most of the scripts are open-ended questions. And then the last point here, which I think is really important, is do everything you can to avoid settling for an email. Now, if you have to settle for an email, send an email, but do everything you can to avoid settling for an email. Well, you know what? Just email me the information. I'll get back to you. What are the chances that they're going to read that email? It depends. It depends on what, how the leads want you to communicate. Yeah, with some, them. You some ask people, that question, right? Some people will, but here's the best, here's the best example I have of emails. Neil Schwartz owns Century 21 Masters. He's the owner. He's a pretty knowledgeable guy, pretty well respected. When an email gets sent to all of our agents from Neil Schwartz, 
The open rate is 32%. He owns the company and is a really good real estate coach and trainer. And only 32% of his own agents open the email. Now I know all that's not emails. bad. 32 is not bad. Usually you get like five, 10, three. Uh, yes, for that's what I'm saying for prospects, but that's my point of emails. They're probably not going to read it. If he can't even get his own agents to read his emails, what are the chances are we're going to get a prospect to read it? It's there, some of them will, but the chance is not likely. So if you have to sell for an email, send the email, but do everything you can to try to set up a meeting. And I would even try to, if you can't meet in person, set up a virtual meeting. You know what? We're really thinking about it. Send me the numbers on what the prop, what we would get from this property and we'll think about it. You know what, Mr. Minnesota, why don't we do this? How about we get together for 15 minutes on Zoom? Okay. That way I can at least show you the net sheet, show you what I'm talking about, and then you can kind of figure it out from there. That personal interaction, even if it's virtual, is far more powerful than just emailing them the CMA, emailing them the net sheet emailing them the market analysis. Again, if you have to do it, do it. Because again, you want to be in the game. So like I said earlier, but if you can <clears throat> somehow get even a virtual presentation, that's the way to go. That's the yeah. way to go. I think sometimes you can email at first so you don't become too threatening to them. So you say, that's right. I will email you information, but I'd like to give you a call and follow up on that. Is that all right? Yeah, you could you could do that. That's fine. But then you also risk that they do they did read it, they didn't like it. Now there's no answering your phone. So if you have to send it, send it. But if you can, if you can get away from it, that would be better. All right, everybody. Well, hopefully there was one or two ideas in there that were.